I did write something that I didn't send you, which is an intro. Uh -huh. So I should probably read that and okay. flatter you. Should I flatter you, or would you prefer I go low? You tell me. Interview or not? Uh, sorry, intro or not? See, I got... really? I'm going in. Introvert. Uh, I'm going. I'm going. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, welcome to this bloody stuttery start to this edition of the Halcyon Show. I'm your host, Lauren Risley, and today, Al, we welcome a man who's cultivated a magnificent career as a writer of popular culture and sports, a successful or a successful author, an esteemed journalist, a prolific and prominent member of the online content sphere, as a member and staff writer of the Athletic. He's appeared on TIFO as an, anal as an analyst. He has hosted interviews with The Rock, Kevin Hart, Sasha Banks, Seamus, The Usos, just to name a few, for Joe. Code UK. It can even catch him on the Talk of the Devils podcast. And if nothing else about that has caught your eye, well, you're about to see the intellectual demonstration of Professor X versus Deadpool because it's the one and only Carl Anker. Hello there. I tripped all over myself in that interview, so I'm ex I'm, I'm hoping you're the one that's going to carry this from here on in. So, God help me as I as I try to pick up the pieces of this because again, nervous. You're a big you're, deal. You're Wade Wilson in this, huh? I guess so, because I never really know where I'm going with these things. A good interviewer would have a... a yeah, I want to get this information from Karl Anker. Karl Anker, this is the answer that I want from you. But instead, I'm more like, huh? What's that thing you just said? Tell me more about that thing That thing you just said. Rather what did than... you make of the... Uh, oh, not even a trailer. The announcement video for Deadpool 3. Current events. I love it already. What did I make of it? Um, it's very Ryan Reynolds. I don't know if it's anything different from the last couple of spiels. What about you? I was really disappointed. What, that Hugh, Hugh Jackman's coming back and that he's going to still yeah. die in Logan and it's going to make canonical sense, except yeah. for no one it's, buys it. It just really makes me sad. That he's not... Right. So, is, so it, it, it's the thing of, one, admitting I'm completely out of ideas, so I'm going to get Hugh Jackman in. I'm like, okay. So, I mean, you're poking fun at it, but you're also still doing it, which is a problem I had with Deadpool 2. Sure, um, sure. So, you know, Deadpool 2. Kills off Wade's girlfriend before the opening credits. So, oh my god, we just, did we just fridge her? And I'm like, yeah, you did. You you making the joke about it doesn't make it okay that you did that. Um, I also really liked the film Logan, and I thought that was a perfect ending. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. That's a really nice bow bow on 17 years of you know pretty mediocre films. And now we're going to bring it back for some dick jokes. And uh, you know, I'm supposed to get excited because there might be a point in time where Jack wears the yellow costume. I just it made me feel old. Well, we are. We are. So I've tried to break this. We are. We're I old. am old. I am we're old. old. It, I have grey hair. Made, we're old. Made, we're I old. have grey hair too. It made me feel old in a way that the MCU didn't always make me feel. The MCU never made me feel old because I grew up with it. But I'm now reaching the point where the MCU is doing things. I'm, going, I'm not doing that. Go away. I'm old. I got heart pain. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, here's the way I take this. A lot of the new properties of the MCU in this latest iteration or phase, whatever you want to call it, it's not for us. It's for it's it's for and this is what people never got about Star Wars and a lot of the new franchises that are, are capitalizing on old. They're not really for you. you. You go and you'll take your kids, and that's the trick. And they'll go and they'll make their own memories. So when my daughter grows up, she'll think Ray was the best Star Wars hero ever, and she'll go. Uh, I never really liked those originals because they're a bit. Meh. I'll be like, you, you little, you have no idea. But that's the hook. Is where we grew up with it. That's what we equate to being that property. And it's the same with the MCU. I grew up with Iron Man in sort of two that when it, whenever that was, so 16, 17, 18, when we went to see those in the cinemas. We grew up with that, and our end game was our cinematic cult of the, the, the accumulation of everything we thought was awesome. And now this phase is for the is for the next generation. It's not meant for us. However, occasionally they'll go, okay, right, you didn't like She-Hulk. You didn't like the, the Eternals. You didn't like, okay, fine. Here's Deadpool with Wolverine. You happy now? No. Well, okay, fine. Here's Spider-Man. But here's the other two Spider-Men that you grew up watching. Are you happy now? Yeah, that was good. Okay, there we this go. It's a good see. story. But, well, but also, know, there's loads of times I'm watching going, this film doesn't necessarily work. You're pressing my button. Stop it's pressing Disney my button. throwing all the money at the problem, just going, listen, who do we need? Just fuck, just take all the money and come in and make us all the money. That's it. And it works. It works. 
I am that sort of nerd in that I want to be pandered to, but I don't want to be seen to be pandered to. <laughs> so when when you when like you want to see give me what I want, but don't make it too obvious you're giving me what I want, otherwise oh, I'll get mad. One hundred percent. That is my that is you know the nerd dilemma right there. Which is 100% where wrestling went wrong for the longest time, when it started simultaneously listening to the internet community and then going, but we gave you what we wanted. What What do you want? Well, yeah, but the problem is we told you what we wanted and then you gave it to us, like with no, did they give no it to subtext. Us no, they did not. Uh, I'm using when I went, and I'm sure you're doing the same thing I'm doing in that we're saying wrestling where actually means WWE. Uh, what was the first interview question? Huh? <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't asked me a question yet. This is me asking you questions. Isn't it? This is the thing, though. You are an you are an accomplished interviewer in the sphere. So I'm looking to you to kind of help me along with some of this because I, if I was sitting across from the rock and Kevin Hart, I'd be simultaneously worried that I was going to make an ass of myself, get crushed, and then get made fun of for being crushed. And you carried yourself with the utmost dignity, respect. You got a good laugh out of them. And I, like, how is it being interviewed versus? Being an interviewer, like, do you do you like it? Is it is it a comfortable experience when you're on podcasts and, well, I guess, not being interviewed, but when you're being grilled? Like, you know, Carl, we want the answers. Tell us the answers. Is it is that comfortable or is that more? Nah, to be honest, I like I like putting the emphasis on the other person to make the interview good. Like, what, I, where, where do you sit? So I used to host Talk of the Devils. So I do a Manchester United podcast. I'm on part of a Manchester United podcast on the Athletic called Talk of the Devils. Uh, it first started partly through the 2019-20 season, and I was the host. And partly through, I went, mm, this isn't going as well as I'd like it to go. Let me go and get some advice on how to be a better host. So I called up some very, very knowledgeable broadcasters in the sports sphere and the non sporting sphere, and I went, what do I need to know to be a good host and to, and to be a host? Because being a host is slightly different from being an interviewer, and there's all slightly different rigmaroles. Um, and the person that I talked to said, do you like telling jokes or do you like setting up jokes? Uh, I said, what? He goes, if you are the host of something, you have to understand the host of something, no one, call, no one watches a show for the host. If you're purely in a hosting capacity, it, you're here, it's the guest. That's what the listener wants. It's like, oh, that's an interesting interview. And then maybe over time, if you can prove yourself as a host, they go, oh yeah, I really like that host because they are able to get X, Y, Z out of the guests, or they bring me very interesting guests. But first and foremost, the host is a setup person. It is not punchline. Uh, and the advice I got was, if you're gonna be a host, don't tell the punchline. You just set up the person, ask them the question, and they deliver the punchline. And that's been the big thing I had to learn when I was being host, and then when Talking Devils came back for the 2021 season we brought in Ian Irvin a fantastic host of podcasts and on broadcasts and a great interviewer in his own right and he is far better at being set up than Punchline because deep down I want to tell the joke I'm, I'm that you know I, I watched Ghostbusters at a formative age and I went oh Bill Murray whereas maybe now as I get slightly older I should I watch Ghostbusters and go oh Howard Ramis is really clever in getting the best out of Bill Murray uh, so that is the big difference, and that's my advice to anyone in the online media space that wants to go. Oh, I want to, I want to be a presenter. I always ask you, do you want to tell jokes or do you want to set up jokes? Because it's two very different things. Uh, I also tell them this thing about what I call Paul Rudd funny. Uh, so, as someone who likes the MCU, you're familiar with the work of Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd is very funny, but Paul Rudd very rarely tells the joke. What tends to happen is someone will tell a joke and then the camera will cut to Paul Rudd and Paul Rudd will pull a face. Like, oh? And that's Paul Rudd non-verbally saying, that thing you just watched was funny. It's really, it's like, it's a very difficult skill halfway between being the straight man and being the punchline deliverer. And Paul Rudd does it very, very well. Uh, and if you're doing an ensemble podcast or, any, or an interview with more than two or three people, when you're the host, you should be one, making sure you set up everyone so they can all tell their punchlines really well. And two, you should be doing Paul Rudd jokes, which is just pulling the face or going, well, that just happened. That sort of stuff, instead of making the punchline for yourself. 
Are these things that you've kind of, so you mentioned there that you sort it out. So have you always been cognizant of where you fell short in your own eyes, or was this feedback that you 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 got from people that you thought, okay, this this isn't just people pissing and moaning for the sake of pissing and moaning. This is constructive, and I need to do something with this. Is that something that you always haven't? Is that something intuitive, or is that something that you've kind of fostered over time? Something I fostered. I mean, I spent most of my teenage years and pretty much all my university years thinking I was the golden child and I'd be an autodidactic genius and I was above everything. I think most of my university work, I got quite low grades because I thought the work was beneath me and I wouldn't put in my best effort. And then when I wouldn't get the best grade, I get really annoyed that I didn't get the best grade. And the teacher went, well, you didn't put in your best effort, so why am I giving you the best grade? I'm like, no, but I'm, I'm the special one. Um, and that led on to two or three early postgraduate professional experiences where I was pretty much an asshole because I absolutely demanded to be given all the help and success and the platform for success, but also I absolutely refused to ask for help um, and refused to listen to help when it was given to me. Uh, and over time I went, well, I keep messing up these opportunities. Maybe it's a me problem. Maybe I need to completely break down my approach to the workplace. Maybe I don't need a work nemesis. Maybe I don't need to spend, uh, maybe I don't need to fire off between 18 and 24 tweets every single day in the office. Maybe I do need to knuckle down, put some headphones in and do the damn work. Maybe I do need to go home and read the thing that someone recommended me to read. And that was a conscious decision I made, I'd say around about mid 2015 in my life. I just went, you know what? I can't keep carrying on this way. Otherwise, I'm just going to get bitter and go, I could have been a contender instead of putting myself about and doing the thing I think I can do properly if I just was less of me. Ag, if that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. I I, I don't know if I share quite that, um, that confidence in my abilities, but I've always been perceived to be intelligent. And that's always been a bit of a burden because then it always meant, it always felt like, you should be further along than where you are rather than where you are and i was like well, right but that's there's a there's a difference like i i i denote intelligence from just knowledge base intelligent people know how to discern outcomes with the minimum of information based on just their innate gifts and abilities whereas a, just a smart person or a person with you know just common sense can distinguish things but only after an accumulation of knowledge and failure um so i wonder then when it comes to the prospect of football writing and and sports analysis and content creation and, and you know in a, in a sphere that's so unbelievably competitive and non-stop considering that it's it's every day in, in fact multiple times a day sometimes how do you contend with because you're always or again it's it's evident in anything that i've ever seen you do you're an in, exceptionally intelligent individual but you deal with a sport let's be honest there's there's a lot of <sighs> What's the, what's the, there's a lot of um you just use the sound effect there's a lot of... it, exactly well, because i i don't consider myself like i said i don't consider myself a particularly intelligent individual but when i hear things like do you know what this is the problem and you go you've given no consideration to any of the ramifications of the solution you're about to give you're just moaning but you're in the position where you have to articulate a lot of the inner workings of football a lot of the nuances of football to a crowd that don't want to hear an hour dissertation. They want to hear, well, you, you oh, come on, we need to get this along. For an intellect like yours and for a disposition like yours, how do you contend with that? Is that an easy process or do you maybe take some, is, I mean, because it's a skill. I mean, there's there's a craft involved in being able to disseminate and to, to sort of condense information into a palatable and yet impactful way. Is that something that you relish then? Yes and no. Do you wish it could be a little bit more expansive then? Yes and no. Um, I, I mean, what you're, you're essentially asking me is, is the printing press dilemma. So every time a new technology happens, there, every time a new technology happens that makes more people able to perform a technology or more, gives people great access to a form of technology or knowledge, there is a pushback from, let's say, the connoisseur. So, uh, Hundreds of years ago, the only books were written by monks and the only people who could read were monks and there were monasteries. Then we get the printing press and then we can make more books. And the argument was, oh my God, if you give loads of people the ability to make books then everyone will make a book. 
um, and you can see that's a everyone can make a book and now <laughs> dot 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 cut to yeah i can yeah yep, yep. and then everyone everyone had well, more people had the ability to make a book uh, and the monks got really annoyed because people were writing things that weren't praising god um but also more knowledge was spread and, and mm. things got better eventually and then uh newspapers same argument the theater same argument television same argument one of the biggest ones was obviously music right so uh at some point in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, it became easier to record music not in a recording studio. And the music companies, the record companies, are still tr struggling to deal with that. Uh, if you give everyone the ability to record a song at home, and everyone's going to record a song at home, dot, 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 um, who decides, blah, blah, blah. So, football media right now, we've given everyone the ability social media blogging the internet smartphones or whatnot has given everyone the ability to talk about football and the way football works there's a game of football every day um there's a fantastic uh, journalist called thomas mortimer who's basically one year just watched a game of football for 365 days uh and he, he said you can do that you just got to find you know, second division football in thailand and in other countries and whatever uh, there's always football going on and the joy of football is that it's a child's game. It's designed to be very cheap to play. The barrier to entry is very, very low. Uh, and even if you don't understand, let's say, the tactical intricacies of football, you can vaguely understand what people are trying to do. Uh, so if you don't, you know, a, a dog in a park will look at a football game and go, oh, everyone's chasing the ball. I'm going to chase the ball. And that's a dog. Um, whereas a person will have slightly more expertise than that. And if you've got any point in time, there's a big game of football, there will be hundreds, if not hundreds of millions, with a hundred thousand, if not hundreds of millions of people commenting on a game of football. So you've got that. Everyone can talk about football, dot, dot, dot. Then you go, who is worth listening to when talking about football? Right. So that's your first challenge. If you are entering football media space, you go, well, first of all, as a reader, you go, who is worth listening to? And my profession as it is i'm a full-time staff writer at a company that operates largely behind a paywall so the first barrier of engagement is i've not only got to convince you i'm worth listening to but i also convince you i'm worth putting your hand in your pocket and paying money for so that is what something i think about a lot uh if you write if you're on the internet and, and you work behind a paywall some kind you've always got to have in the back of your mind at some point not everyone's going to read past the first paragraph and not everyone is going not everyone is going to want to read past the first paragraph quite, because at some point every single person engaged with work is going to have that thing hey uh do you mind giving me a quid for this and uh, more, more, more people than not will say no or say maybe next time so that's that's one point of consideration i have to have in this space then i've got to go so once i've convinced you hey i'm worth listening to then i go hey i might be worth paying money for then i gotta go what am I going to do now I've got your attention cost and maybe a small amount of money from you? Sometimes that means I'm going to just entertain you, right? Sometimes I'm going to be like, hey, here's a bunch of jokes and a bunch of, and a bunch of things that you might not have seen that I think are quite funny and I hope you find them funny too. Sometimes I'm going to go, here is something that you may not have paid attention to yet, but is something I think you'll find quite interesting. So that's when I shift into to educator mode or academic mode. Or you have some things where I will go, you, know, you have columnist mode, where I'll go, hey, certain thing happened on the news. This is what I think about that. And that can be quite hard, especially when you are younger in your career. Because you know, when I first started off writing, why would anyone want my personal opinion on the situation? Surely most people would want the opinions of the football, professional football players or someone on television or a much older journalist. Uh, and then over time, by doing the other stuff very well, gradually, hopefully, you get to a point where people go, actually, I want Carl Anker's opinion on this. Uh, and that's what I hope to do sometime as well. So yeah, it's a, it's a interesting position in a very interesting media space. Sometimes I'm a Sometimes I write like an academic. Sometimes I try and write like an artist. Sometimes I try and write like a novelist. Sometimes I have to write like a statistician. 
sometimes I have to write like a historian. Uh, and very often I have to pretend like I'm a mechanic in that I will look at something, go it's broken and go, how do I fix this? Okay. Interesting. Because well, that, that was one of the things that I, um, in, in doing research for this, a few of the podcasts that I've seen you on, I see you almost try to like kind of what you've described which is listen you you've brought your the way if we use the 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 uh, the, the car is as a as a as a metaphor here they bring you this this man united is it's broken it needs a director of football it needs a central defensive midfielder and they don't use their wing backs enough and you go okay well first of all let me take a look at it and make sure i concur with your diagnosis because you're not a mechanic uh, it's why you brought it here and then you come out and say well listen okay um here's your problem and it's going to cost you this to fix in the same way a mechanic does and there's never a good way of breaking that news because it's always more time consuming more costly and more of an inconvenience than the person would hope so you try and placate them by saying something to the effect of well i mean if you if you need to get away with this today you could do this but you're going to be back here next week d- 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 that'll do yep yeah, that'll do fine is that never a frustration i mean because again i understand perfectly what you're saying which is you know you, you You've got to listen to the audience and give them ultimately what they want because that is your um, or what they're what they're um, what they're prepared to consume. I guess is is the way to phrase that. But at the same time, you know you have influence and your intelligence is going to invite curiosity and debate and conflict because people are going to want to challenge your opinions and you seem better equipped than most to be able to defend those opinions with rationale. Is do do you ever find yourself wanting to? kind of elevate the argument and elevate the discussions rather than engaging in the points that are being made on the face merit which is what i see happen a lot not necessarily by you but by a lot of people that see problems within their football clubs they they deal with things on a very short term or at least very superficial basis i mean nothing's binary right the the longer you work in football the more you realize nothing is binary there is more than one side there's more than one version of a story um multiple truths can be evident at the same time mm. and everything exists on a spectrum so in terms of that diagnostic i'll give you an example so right now so we are recording on a wednesday evening i am currently writing a piece on harry Maguire. okay uh, and the piece i've been asked to do is harry Maguire is not in a great run of form what should gareth southgate do now the succinct pub version of that is drop him he's rubbish is my is, is one pub version of it, right one uh, a certain thing you might find on social media is yeah just yeah, glug flack yeah we crack on with our darts rubbish. game yeah you know, this and this and this right yeah. van der Vaart, who's been very 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 loud about his criticism harry Maguire, might say words to that effect uh, and yeah maybe you know i could write that uh, and follow that and see what my editor thinks but what i'm going to do is, and I'm talking to you right now as I'm partway through this piece. First of all, we need to look at one, why is Gareth Southgate so keen on Harry Maguire? So first you've got to explain that. Two, so you say, why is Gareth, why does Gareth Southgate like Harry Maguire in the first place? So that's basically- Yeah, you've got to set the table first of all. You've got to establish what the truth is, 100%. So, yeah, so you do that. Why does Southgate like Maguire? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain good Harry Maguire. So Harry Maguire's last good season, I'm going to explain what he did. Two, I'm then going to explain why is Harry Maguire not doing that anymore? So I'm going to look at last season and say, these things happened. This is how his things went. Whoop. Three. And so in the two, I go, see, when Harry Maguire is good, he's really useful. But Harry Maguire has not been like that for a while, which gives Southgate two things to do. He can either have faith that Maguire comes good, or he can find an alternative. Then you go into number three. And three is something that I don't think, three is something I don't necessarily have to do, but I'm choosing to do because that's how I want the piece to run. So three is, before we continue, Let's talk about Gareth Southgate's England. So I'm going to explain to you how the England team work because they're a completely different ecosystem as compared to club football. There'll be a lot of pieces and I think there'll be a lot of arguments just saying Harry Maguire is bad, full stop. And we'll, we'll lump together his club form and his country form and whatnot and not 
discuss the two very different ways football managers approach problems and how Harry Maguire has been useful to two different types of football managers. So I'm going to explain what England do. Then, point four, I'm going to go, here are the alternatives in an England setup for Harry Maguire, if someone wished, and explain why those people are alternatives. That was That is a case of a conversation you might hear in the pub what should England do about Harry Maguire? That could be a 30 minute owl effing blinding certain certain things calling slabhead. And me going, well, actually, here is a short dissertation on that. Now, should that be a short dissertation? Probably not. I am going to have to, I'm going to explain a couple of times. I'm also not going to explain them in the. I'm not going to try and be comprehensive in everything I described because. If you do, everything turns up being two to three thousand words long, and, and and two, you just end up being absolutely exhausted. Uh, something I've I've learned over the last two seasons covering football is, if you try and be comprehensive in every single piece of work you do, you exhaust yourself and you risk burnout. Uh, so there are, uh, and something that you can do a lot more now you're writing online is you can put in Easter eggs and jokes and nudges and go. Remember that thing? We'll get back to that at a later date. Wink, wink. I used to do this a lot when I was covering Southampton, where I'd say, hey, here's the thing. I'm going to get back to you in January because I need three or four more games to hit the sample size total. Uh, and that's how, yeah, elevate things. Well, because I asked that question because I see a lot of parallels in, in different things. Um, in this instance, I see the parallels that some football, not all, but some football uh, media faces in, in line with MMA. So MMA has the same problem whereby it attempts to lift the lid on certain topics, it attempts to elevate the conversation, it attempts to add some diversity to some of the narratives that are, that are at play. But broadly speaking, whenever they do, a lot of the pushback is from the fans who are just, listen, man, I just, I just want to know who won the fight and who they're fighting next. When's Connor coming back? And all this other stuff where it's like, are you not interested in some of the nuance? I mean, it, it, there's so much to play with here. And yet we seem to be returning to the same narratives a lot of the time, which is, and you kind of alluded to this, and this always frustrated me about football fandom specifically. He's bad, he's good. Well, he's, well, it depends. Like, I don't know about you, I have bad days and good days at work, and there's a multitude of factors that factor into that, including, do you know what, this coffee's shit. That can ruin my day sometimes. Like, imagine being a professional athlete with literally millions of people on your back at every minute of the day, scrutinizing your every move for any inkling of information that they can possibly derive and put it on a thumbnail and say it's an exclusive. That's a lot of pressure for, for a kickoff. And then you just, the natural decline, the ups and downs of being a human being, like the idea that it can be so, like you say, binary and he's good, he's bad, get rid of him or he's good, get him in immediately. It just seems very reductive. And something that I just thought that fandom would have been evolved because I'm constantly being told the consumer is more sophisticated now than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I don't see that sophistication. I don't. I still see that same palette of meat and potatoes. That's all I want. Don't give me the foie gras. Don't give me the sort of a soucion of something else. Well, so it's interesting. There's, there's a time and a place for everything, right? Sure, 100%. Um, and let's be real i i work for a company that has a reputation for writing big pieces sure uh, uh, so i i recently had a conversation with jamie carragher and i was talking about the sandra martinez and partly through he shot back like oh yeah you put that on the athletic it'll be a three thousand long article and that was his joke about how everything on the athletic is uh very serious wearing glasses trying to be urban and erudite whereas that's not the case, or I don't want it to be the case. If you read a lot of my pieces, there's a lot of jokes in there. There's a lot of analogies in there. There's quite a few film references, uh, and uh, if you, there's quite a few people that don't like me for that reason, which is fine. And it's interesting that you describe fandom and, and, the, and the customer being more sophisticated. I think the consumer is more sophisticated, but also yeah. I think you, there is, there is. You have to have bread. You have to have meat and potatoes, right? You you can't eat foie gras every day. You get gout. You can't eat steak every day. <laughs> you can't you can't eat steak every day. You, you, your guts will get bad. You have to have at some level, um, a making sure you you know everything in moderation and make sure you have got all the colours on the plate. You've got to have some fibre. You've got to have some grains. You've got to have this. You've got to have that. And so I 
I am in and out of F1. And the thing that annoys me the most when I read uh, a race result at the F1 is, does the piece have just the entire listing of who finished where at the bottom? And yeah, yeah, look, I can, you, I can, there is a time and a place for me to read about the changes to the, to uh, Honda's new engine and the Eric Dino design about that. There is a time and a place to read about the fantastic relationship between Sebastian Vettel uh, and Schumacher Jr. But if you are not able to cater to a market or a reader that just needs to know who finished where, you are doing a failure, right? There are. Uh, I've worked for one very big prestigious online company and they explain it to me this way. There are two big markets you need to address when you are working in online media. You need to understand that people are bored at work <laughs> and you need to understand that people are bored in queues. Uh, and that was the distinction between writing for when you're writing on desktop and writing for when you're writing for mobile. Uh, and look, I understand interest in fandom, I understand curiosity, but something I often have to stop myself from getting annoyed about and getting frustrated about is, this is my job. This is the thing I have to think about from nine to six, or sometimes nine to nine, or sometimes nine to 10, or six days a week. This is people's fun. This is playtime, right? Even though this is a job, my job is I report on the highest level of a children's game. Yeah, you provide a degree of escapism for a lot of people. Right, I provide a degree of escapism and there's something that, that became very apparent to me during the pandemic where uh, I had a lot of people message me saying your writing's really good and it's got me through the pandemic and your podcasts have, really, have been really interesting and it feels like I'm listening to one of my mates. And I went, of course, you don't think about a certain subject about how you know a football team attacks corners for three hours a day because you have a job to do. Have your own job you have your own things you have to worry about buying milk you have to worry about uh you know the pain in your ankle you have to worry about whether or not your bills are gonna get paid it's my job to do that thinking for you and then present that thinking to you in a way that you can digest in the way you want to digest so yes there will be some times where if someone goes i don't care about i don't want the three thousand word dissertation on harry Maguire. i just want you to explain to me very quickly which players should they bring in there's a 3,000 word version of the piece I'm trying to write. There's also an 800 word version of the piece. I'm going to try and do the 3,000 word piece because it's the international break. It's not been a Premier League game right now. I have a little bit more time. But also, if it's a different time of the season, you know, let's say it's the the day after a Europa League game and Manchester United play again on Sunday, this the next version of that piece will be 800 words because people were time poor. And I'm, I'm aware of I've got to fit certain things in certain gaps. And yes, there will be times where I can get quite frustrated in that we appear to be having the same argument. So uh, I tweet this quite often, but every international break, the same half a dozen arguments will appear in football Twitter. There'll be a conversation about whether or not the state of football has declined. There'll be a big conversation about Messi versus Ronaldo. There'll be a big conversation about who succeeds Messi versus Ronaldo. Someone who supports Arsenal will make some sort of comment about how Thierry Henry was robbed for the 2004 Ballon d'Or. <laughs> <laughs> These things happen over and over and over again. And I've been, you, know, I've, you think about the copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And I, you know, it used to really frustrate me a couple of years ago because I went, why aren't we further along in our development? But you have to get, to, you have to understand, not everyone has the same amount of time and resources to dedicate to things that you do. Not everyone is the same age as you do. Not everyone has the same advantage as you do. If this, this, just because I've seen the argument about Nedved versus Henri 500 times, it, it genuinely might be the first time that person has discovered it. And I can either get mad about it, or I can just go, hey, I've already covered this for you. Please read this comment about why the Ballon d'Or doesn't really matter. Um, and that's what, you're, that's what I'm trying to do more of now, is going, hi, person, I've already solved that issue for you. Would you like to read it? It's in the archives. You know, you're a person who has spent a long time on the internet, I can tell by the state of your bedroom. Uh, I'm sure, that's a joke. <clears throat> I'm sure you've encountered two or three problems. Joe, um, I, I'm just gonna jump in and say, a year ago, two years ago, my wall would have been adorned with all the pop culture references. I'm currently renting a room with maho with, with fucking uh, Magnolia walls, so I can't put shit up in case I mark it. Otherwise, your joke would have landed solidly, but I have to look around and, and See, Go ahead. Sorry. There, that was a poor rod joke. 
<laughs> but I'm no good at the setup. I gotta be the guy that does the. Uh, well, I, did, I did the punchline, then you did the poor run, looking around. Like, Wait, what? I'm the John Stewart tapping the table, making the face, having instigated the joke. That's that's where I come in. And I, that's what you want to be. That's what you want to be. Well, I never managed the Trevor Noah style of being able to deliver it straight rather than to have to pause and wait for the audience's reaction. He's more skilled in that aspect than I, so I will ever practice. be. So. And if you, if you understand mechanics, you can master those things too. Um, but the point I was going to make before I said the joke was um, everything's iterative. And as I'm getting older and as I watch more football, I'm getting a greater appreciation for how things are iterative and not definitive. Uh, so when you have when i have prob when i have tech problems and i go google something and i find someone in 2008 had the same tech problem and then someone three months after that went here is here is the answer i'm like oh look knowledge that was imparted years ago that's useful to me now i feel part of a greater whole uh, and that is what i feel sometimes as well if i am sure the harry Maguire conversation will be here again 55 days from now when the world cup starts but when it does happen, I can go, hello everyone, here's a piece I did in September. And even then, the piece I'm doing right now is iterating on a piece I did last March. I'd never considered that as a as a way of looking at it. The, the fact that you're effectively laying foundations. That's that's actually that's a very that's a very good point. I'd never looked at it that way. I guess I, I'm more concerned with the immediacy and the and the the, the the protracted nature of this rather than what you've what you've said there, which is look the answers are there it's just maybe people haven't found them yet and they will that's something that's a that's a very god you're clever i really hate i hate talking to people cleverer than me i well, really I do for so, not for kissing don't worry well listen no i'm just saying I'm like that's a that's a really insightful way to look because i i had this argument with joe divine about the, the 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 shortening of content and he made the point of saying look it isn't it is horses for courses to a certain degree it doesn't all have to be this thing new generations have different iterations and so on and so forth and yeah i think it's 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 more indicative of that but i tell you what let me just shift gears for a second because i want to just i don't know just just give you a break from your job i guess which is to think about things fifa or football manager which are you picking uh i haven't played full fat football manager for several years now not because i don't like it but because I know what I'll do if I play it, which is not do all the other things I need to do in my life. Oh, it's going to consume your life? Oh, it's all consuming. I, I think I played, I think I played a version of Football Manager 2013 till 2021. Um, the summer of 2014, I played Football Manager Handheld, and that was my sort of dip my toe in. Not, not the full dose. Just you know. <laughs> <laughs> watered down stuff which my friend went yeah you can play that and I kept missing my train because uh, I used to I used to get a train in and out of work and I would often miss my stop because I was playing it too much so I don't play football manager anymore not because I don't like football manager but because I absolutely adore football manager and I know what it will do for me uh, and I have I think I have every copy of football manager I, like, every, I, I buy it pretty much every year and I play it for maybe 20 minutes and I go nope 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 nobody nope nobody nope 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 I've got to write a book. Nope, 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 nope. I've got to do this. I don't do that. So I don't do that. Um, FIFA had a huge, huge uh, FIFA <laughs> habit. I'll call it a habit. Yeah, you so, can call it a habit. Uh, so I, you know, initially, I was I was a Pro Evolution Soccer boy. I had Pro Evolution Soccer <clears> four. <throat> got the downloaded all the kits and did all that. So I didn't buy Pro five. Played Pro six. Got Pro seven. Uh, and then when FIFA 09 came out, that was a, you know, the Xbox 360, that was around about the time when FIFA became better than Pro. Uh, adopted FIFA, played on nine ridiculous levels. Uh, there was a glitch in the Xbox 360 version when Ultimate Team came out. So I, I remember playing Ultimate Team for a bit and then all the achievements unlocked for me all at once. Uh, and I won everything in Ultimate Team 09. And I, I remember stopping, looking up in the sky, and I went, this is your doing, isn't it, God? You want me to get all my A-levels? Fair enough. <laughs> So I got in my A-levels, I went to, uh, I think it was two days before university, and I got the achievement for playing FIFA 09 for 50 hours. And I said, I've got to stop doing this, otherwise I'm not going to make any friends at university. Go to university, make a bunch of friends because I played FIFA so much, play FIFA all the time. Partway through third year, my uh, dissertation advisor 
basically trapped me in a room and went, I don't know what you're doing or what's going on in your life or what sort of substance abuse you're doing, but you're massively behind the dissertation and you need to fix it. And I said, it's, it's FIFA 12. And she went, what? Uh, and I, I said, I, I play close to three or four hours of FIFA 12 a day. And she looked at me and gave me a sort of deep blink and went, okay, I'm mildly relieved that it's not a hard substance abuse problem. So hopefully you can stop doing this, but I hope you understand that you need to stop doing this because you have to get your dissertation done. Got my dissertation done, start work, you know, enter the workforce, start interning for sabotage times. One of the very first things they asked me at sabotage times was, hey, does anyone want to preview FIFA 13? I just went, hello, cracks knuckles. Um, and then got into a, a I think I reviewed, I reviewed FIFA 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And it was around about 18 when the jump, the jump properly made up to PS4. So I didn't have, I didn't buy a PS4 very early on because I was, I essentially didn't have the money. So I didn't review FIFA 18. And then 19, uh, so I didn't get FIFA 19 on release. I think FIFA 19 was the first one I didn't buy on day of release. No, so FIFA 18 I didn't get because I didn't have a PS4. FIFA 19 I didn't buy on day of release. I went, well, I, I can survive with this for a while. Uh, then I got the job at The Athletic uh, and I was the Southampton reporter and I went, right, how do I learn Southampton Football Club very quickly? And I wasn't playing football manager because I knew I'd be addicted to football manager. So what I did was I started a career mode. Well, not just what I did. I did many, many, many things to learn Southampton Football Club very quickly. Um, but one of the things I did on top of everything was I got FIFA 19. I started a career mode on legendary difficulty so I couldn't rely on my FIFA skills. Uh, and. and just played several games with the time and went, okay, so this guy's not very quick. Okay, this guy's passing abilities, this and this and this. And I say this guy, I meant not the starting 11. So I moved everyone from the starting 11 out of team management. So I've been over squad players as well. Um, this did cause some confusion because not every Southampton player has been motion captured. So there was a point in time where I thought um, Southampton's third choice goalkeeper was Southampton's second choice left back. Uh, don't do that. So yeah, that's that's in short. I, I love them both. I don't play either one that much because I've I've got many many other things to do in my life. Not it, not to say if you have many other things to do in your life, you can't play those things. I'm just in a position where I know how much FIFA I like to play. I know how much football manager I like to play. And um, if I you know if it's six, we're recording this right now. It's twenty past six. If I loaded up football manager right now, I would play that until two o'clock in the morning. And if I loaded up FIFA right now, I'd play that until. 10.30, go, oh no, I need to make dinner, eat dinner while simulating games and then keep playing FIFA <laughs> some more. <laughs> I love it because, again, the generic experiences that we all have, you, you almost know when you're becoming a man fully when you start to go, can I make this FIFA last another year? Tell me about this year's FIFA. Tell me what, what's new about it. Oh, okay, is that it? Uh, no, I can live with 19 for another year if that's all it's got. Is the manager mode any better? Oh, you can just do... Oh, okay. Do you know what? No, I'm good. I'll get FIFA 22 on the Game Pass for £15 instead of paying 80 quid for it in a year's time. It's not a problem. It's a measure of manhood, I'm telling you. One, with... one thing that makes me happy and sad is there was a point in my life, in my early 20s, when a lot of my socialising, uh, I say my soft socialising, was done around FIFA. Um, a lot of my non-drinking daytime, I'm going to go to my friend's house, was done around, do you want to play FIFA? Uh, and it makes me happy that I'm now at a place with my friends where I don't necessarily have to have the distraction of playing FIFA to talk to them. But I do miss um, the fact that, I, well, I, I used to be a lot better at FIFA. And this is my, you know, FIFA is the sort of first, like, oh, maybe I'm getting a bit old. Maybe I'm not youth culture anymore. There was a point in time in my life where I go up to someone you know, I go around to a house party, I'd, go, I'd do something and there'd be an event and there'd be a FIFA thing on and I'd pick up a pad and I'd be one of the best people in the room. Uh, I have played Shells from the eSport section of FIFA and he's been the champion once and I played him at game of FIFA and I won. And it, like, I'm very proud of that because it was an utter smash and grab and he probably went really, really easy on me. But that's my, that's my like, one call to fame, that I beat a professional FIFA player. Uh, whereas now, because I don't play, I don't own I, I didn't own FIFA 22 until more than halfway in the season. 
Uh, and I don't play early FIFA and I don't understand the metagame the same way I used to understand the metagame. I'm not that good at FIFA, which is one of those moments where if the, if I go into an office, you know, a lot of these high flouting we work some other tend to have a PlayStation somewhere, I'll go, oh, FIFA. And there'll be someone there who is not as old as me going, you want to play FIFA? And I'm like, yeah, I can play FIFA. I'm just as good as I need to smoke me. And I go, oh, maybe I'm old now. Maybe I can't hold my liquor the same way I used to. Maybe, maybe the time is calling for me. It, it isn't, it isn't. I mean, I'm still of the opinion, again, 32 years old, you're a little bit younger than me, which is a, which, considering your career is, but I really need to get on with some shit in my life, it seems. But it, it's one of those things where you go, nah, man. Like, I used to look at 32 year olds when I was a kid, think that's an adult, that is. That's a man with his life together, with everything figured out. He's just living his life and doing his. Do you know what? I'm convinced they didn't have a fucking idea, but they were really good at acting like they did. So it's, I don't think you ever really have grown up, if that makes sense. I think there's just a lot of grown babies walking around, for, for lack of a better phrase. <laughs> okay. It's just my humble opinion. Again, I, I just re, the recontextualization of certain things in life as you grow up. And like you say, like the same recurring arguments. And yet you think, how can people smarter than this haven't figured this out? It's not that. It's like you say, generations come up, encounter the same issues. They then hit the same hurdles and they go on from there. And it's it's kind of it's kind of reassuring in a way the fact that it's that there is stuff figured out down the line. It's just that you know it, it might it might take someone smarter than you to open your eyes, or at least in my case, it might take someone smarter than me to open my eyes to it. Um, can I ask you a question? It is an interview you after all. You you you're not contractually obliged to answer it, of course, but you 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 know you could do me a favour and answer it. With regards to your aspirations as you've kind of gone through your career, then. You know, starting off, going through the gears at different organisations at different at different levels, and um, getting new experiences. How have your aspirations changed as you've kind of, you know, in your own, you know, in your own way, grown through the industries that you've worked in, and now being a writer, the passion for literacy you have, and obviously your your skill at articulation and the way you're able to conduct and present yourself in a in a meaningfully, um, you're very approachable on ca- like every time I watch an interview, you're so just. Un- just un- unapologetically approachable with a dry wit as well just to keep people on their toes and make sure they're still listening but how have you evolved through the process how have your aspirations changed um so there's the intrinsic motivations and there's the external motivation so intrinsically there were certain things i wanted to do there were certain publications i wanted to write for for reasons some sensible some not sensible uh and i <laughs> went out there and, and tried my hardest to, to, to get there. I want to learn a thing. This person told me you should be a journalist. And while I had at the time an intention of one day writing for the magazines I bought, which was pre- primarily Enemy and Games Master magazine, I had to learn skills first. And I went, who's available? I graduated in 2012, right in the chaos of the post recession thing. So it was very much I need to figure out what context I know. I need to build up from a low base and learn from all these other people. And in those internships, hopefully, thankfully, I impressed in a way that they recommended me to other places. And that's how I worked. And not to denigrate FHM, not to denigrate Zoom. I learned Zoo, I learned loads from those magazines. Uh, working at FHM was my first real instance of understanding that me as a reader of FHM might not necessarily be what every reader of FHM looks like. So the majority of FHM readers did not live in London and were very annoyed about the London focused media. So at the time FHM ran a number of pieces that had nothing to do with London that often talked about Blackburn or talked about Oldham or talked about uh, Birmingham. And that was my first one. Yeah, I am not the default. I am not the protagonist. And I need to write with an audience in mind. I need to be able to pitch better. Uh, when you go off to work for Zoo, yes, Zoo was a glamour magazine and it came out every single week and it was very popular among a certain fan base because it, it had naked or near naked people in there. But also, how did Zoo survive in an age where there was naked people all over the internet? Because they had other things in there too and were very good at disseminating information and I, very, very quickly. So how do you explain the best jokes from Edinburgh Fringe in 200 words? How do you explain the new iPhone in 50 words? 
And that was something I first picked up at Zoo. And then you take that skill and you go off and do something else. Uh, so yeah, that was that was the initial thing. So I, I didn't go, oh, I want to work at that magazine because I want to look at very pretty people. Oh, I wasn't in. Oh gosh, I wasn't insinuating that at all. I was. It was more along the lines of so. When when you like, because I think you actually mentioned it in in, in in your response just there. Like you 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 look at when you get in to something, you usually have your eyes on a prize already. Like that that's where I want to be. But you get in somewhere, and it's like that knowledge curve where you start, and I think I know everything, and then you actually learn something. You go, oh, I know, I have no idea. I may never learn this. And then as you develop your understanding, it gets progressive in that. Okay, well I don't know everything, and it adjusts your aspirations accordingly. So what I was curious about was because you've accomplished a tremendous amount in your career so far in like you say an age where a lot of mediums have shifted and changed a significant amount the consumption of content has changed significantly even in the last five years and obviously notwithstanding the pandemic so from from your start point to now i mean is there a big change in your aspirations or generally speaking are you still kind of after the same thing in your career would you say no because again it so that this the, the internal motivation the initial internal motivation is, is you know, there's the rap lyric, all I ever wanted was to never end up broke. Uh, and that was one, and that's one that will probably be there in my entire life. Of, there is a certain amount of money I have to pay certain companies uh, every month because direct debits, uh, and I like to hit them. Uh, there is the intrinsic one of, I like learning stuff. They just reach a point in education, a point in writing pieces where I went, I can't do the same thing every single day. I have to be improving my knowledge of the subject I'm writing about as I'm writing about it even more. Uh, so I've often gone to companies and gravitated towards people that can teach me stuff I don't know. Uh, and it can also teach me about the world and parts of the world I don't know. So I haven't really traveled that much, but I have worked in companies and worked with people who are very worldly and very able to explain the world. I, you know, I worked at Play Tribune. There were a number of Brazilian members of staff there. We had loads of conversations about Brazil uh, and their history of bootlegging uh, and you know the intrepid nature of Brazilians and how good they are at bootlegging stuff and how that is a response to the, the former uh, dictatorship that was in charge up until the 80s. Uh, because I, well, I, I didn't know that. I wanted to learn that. So I, I would work with people that, that could teach me that. I had a bartending job for ages and just learnt loads talking to all the bartenders. Uh, yeah, those are the motivations I've always had. There's the external motivations of you got not only you got to pay rent, but you, sometimes you want to live differently. You sometimes you want to live well. There's also the external motivations of very early on, I'd say part way through the 2010s, it became apparent the magazines weren't going to make it, and we need to figure out what you need to do next. So then you go, okay, it gets to 2015, and everyone was being told learn to code. So did you learn to code or not? I learned to code an okay amount. I, I know HTML, I know CSS, I know JavaScript. I'm, I'm really bad with Python and Ruby. So there was a level in there. Uh, there was a came point in 2014 where it became really apparent, I need to learn Photoshop because we're moving towards a more online space. And if you didn't know any form of image manipulation, visual jokes and visual punchlines were going to be way harder for you. So that was a skill you had to learn. So those were those motivations. I always wanted to write a book. The opportunity came about for me to write a book. And I went, I've never written one before. And the challenge of writing a book that was presented to me was something I didn't necessarily predict or envision. But I went, I'm going to give this my absolute hardest. And I'm going to go talk to other people who've been in such similar situations to help me write this book as well. So that's what I went off and did. And I think that's the... You should have a... I had a really good professional chat with someone who has won a lot of journalism prizes. And he said, whenever you seek out, you seek out to do something, you should know what are your guiding principles and what you do just out of habit. And your guiding principles should always be a very, very small list. Um, but you should always be cognizant of what you do from habit. And that habit, if you're just doing a habit, you can throw it out. There was a point in time where I would write nine to 14, 400 word articles a day. And that was important because it helped me do certain things in my life and helped me pay 
certain bills and help me live a certain way. But you also go, at a certain point, is this the best thing for me to do? So then you have to pause and you have to pivot and say, well, actually, I'm kind of doing this out of habit. Let me go and, and chase online or guiding principles, which is, I'm naturally curious. I want to learn other things. Let me go find that. So off you go. It's one of my questions, actually. I mean, what piques your curiosity? Is there anything in particular about subjects or, or aspects of life generally that is it is it stuff that you don't know? Is it stuff that you only have a passing understanding of? Or is it just your own? I mean, for me, it's usually um, like a, a window. It's like, oh, I didn't know that. I now need to know everything about that thing. You know what I mean? It's 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 why Wikipedia has been a bane of my existence because uh, you know you click on one thing and then suddenly you want to learn everything about the band you happen to be watching. You want to know everything about every cast member of every film, at least in my case. But what piques your curiosity? No, it's pretty much the same. So yeah, the, it's the joke of you, you pull a thread and a jump and the entire jumper comes unstuck. And I'm I'm like you. I re- I remember I was 50 years of age when I got broadband in my house and I spent a lot of it on Wikipedia. Uh, I think I went, oh my God, it's a machine god. It's got knowledge of every single TV show I remember watching as a cartoon. I went, oh my God, now I can know the finale. And I clicked and I clicked and I clicked and I clicked and I clicked. Um, and I I remember being on Wikipedia one day and it had the Time 100 list of like the greatest novels of all time. And they went, the, the, the only uh, comic book on this list is Watchmen. I went, what's Watchmen? Clicked on Watchmen. I went, this sounds absolutely incredible and nothing like the comic books I normally read. Go on Amazon, buy Watchmen. Who's Alan Moore? Alan Moore's written a leading extraordinary gentleman with Viva Veneta. Oh, I've heard of Viva Veneta, the film. Didn't really enjoy it. He's based on this book, Click. Go buy Viva Veneta from the books, Click. What else has Alan Moore also done? Oh, he's collaborated with this person, Click. Bang, let's do this one. What was the inspiration? The inspiration was uh, this. Alan Moore thinks he's a magician. Right? He believes in magic. He, he genuinely believes in, he's a wizard. Um, what's modern magic looking like? Click. Da, 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 da. And that's how I often go about learning. Is it very often occurs to me. I now see something or I've noticed something. And I'll go, "What is that?" And then I'll go off and try and learn what that is. And it often opens up loads of funnels for me. So. I'm just pulling your face. You can now ask me another question. <laughs> I, I, uh, do you know what I hate in most interviews is when people are too quick to jump in. I hate that. I, I can't remember who it was. It was one of my subjects, and I was like, I have to just tell you something very quickly. The next time an interviewer does this to you, I want you to slap them, slap them hard across the face, because I can't watch an interview with someone and have the interviewer constantly cutting you off. In fact, there was a there was an interview you were on where you were asked a question. And it was like a 10 point question, like a five point question or something. And after you gave the first point, there's another five questions. So the original five list isn't answered. It's like, you just asked him to give you your top five things and you've jumped in with your own opinion on the first fucking thing. Let the man talk. So it's it's awkward when you've got to leave pauses in the interviews because I like to listen. You know, I want to hear I want to hear what you have to say. I don't want to just chime in with Do you know, that's interesting. But what else is interesting? You know what I mean? It, it just kind of spoils the ebb and flow of a, of a conversation for me. You know what I mean? The, the advice I was given was to practice the two second rule. So two I, second when, rule. when I'm interviewing someone, I literally count to two every time they finish speaking before I start speaking. Because then you, because when you start doing that, it's really important. It's really useful for if you're doing round tables, uh, press conferences, interviews, um, anything where there's loads of people at a table and you don't want to dominate com- conversation. Just any time someone is finished speaking, count to two before you start speaking and you'll be surprised at how many times you would have interrupted. And he's okay. got it there. There we go. <laughs> I can't count. That's a problem. So um, a couple of other questions then because we are, we're, you know, our time is drawing short and I, I'm interested to kind of delve into your gaming a little bit if that's okay because one of the things that strikes me about you as an individual is like you say you 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 you, you've got a you've got a hunger for a lot of you seem to just have a lot of a lot of anecdotes and information and knowledge base gaming is is one of those weird art forms that doesn't really afford you a lot in terms of knowledge but 
when I was a kid at least, it, it, get, it was my gateway as well, socially. It was one of those things where if I didn't know someone, in fact, one of my best friends I met just because I was talking about Knights of the Old Republic. Love it. Brilliant game. Fantastic. Guy turns around and goes, what do you think of the sequel? There's a sequel. How did you not know there was a sequel? Because I, right, we were poor and I, we only had one computer and the games that I got at the time were usually Lens and all the rest of it. I bought maybe one game a year and it was usually a, it was a sports game or something. Like I played International Superstar Soccer Pro International on the PlayStation 1 for about four years That's just because I didn't good. have... Very good. Very good imitation of the commentator. Well, I played it enough to hear it enough. Like even things like Zero Slowly, Delight. Like, Slowly, they are turning the screw. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Like that—that that became sort of. And I remember the, the the gameplay of that being brilliant. But now, if I played it, I imagine I'd want to stab myself in the leg. But the point is that gaming was a great advocate for socialization with me. But I never. Like, except for now that I'm playing games by Kojima, like Metal Gear Solid 5, I'm learning, you know, like, warfare is more complicated than shooty shooty blam blam. Like, yeah, check all this shit out. Like, uh, preferred it when it was a bit less complicated than this, but okay. Um, what? You played Metal Gear Solid 5? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, did you play Metal Gear Solid 1, 2, 3? No. There it is. Okay. <laughs> Right. That it was, was too. About, was it was going... too hard when I were a kid because it Fair wanted enough. you to sneak around. And when I was a kid, the first, first, the first shooting game I think I ever remember playing was the Die Hard series yeah. with the with the gun. Yeah. Because that was fun because you just pointed it and shot. It was easy. Yeah. And the other two games I didn't play because they were harder. Um, and plus, I don't know about you. I don't know. This is a weird thing about games. I can't play games that have got those like um, the boxes that you can see the corner of, like that infinite thing gives me anxiety i can't explain why it just it, it creeps me out i don't like the idea of me being on a spot but it goes on forever that's a niche kick it's weird i'm playing zone of the enders the hd collection Excellent now game. and it's i love i love the mechanics of the game i love how simplistic and yet the fact that they managed to get this to work on a two-prong controller but what i hate is all the maps have edges and the edges then stop and then blackness forever it creeps me out don't like it don't like it the fear of the void, huh? I don't know. I mean, I can't listen. I'll get the over it one day. The great unknowable void. It's scary to me. But the, my point to that then is that um, gaming is something that also afforded me an avenue into YouTube because I got into independent reviews. Um, so tiny little titles that no one's ever going to hear of. Gaming is very important to me as a hobby. It was my first portal into writing on a near weekly bit basis. It was my first ever beat. Uh, at any point in time when someone went, hey Carl, could you review this video game for me? I would back myself to do that, providing I had the console. And I've got, I mean, at this point in time, I've got the consoles. I'm, I'm pretty much always going to have the consoles. I don't game as much as I used to because quote unquote the real world gets on the way. So there was a point in time between late 2020 and I want to say early 2022, where I just didn't play any computer games because I had to do other stuff. But at the moment, I think I'm spending maybe 90 minutes every day playing Horizon Forbidden West, and I'm very much enjoying it. I'm very much looking forward to when God of War Ragnarok comes on. Again, at any point in time, someone went, hey, Carl, do you want, you want to review these things? I'd say probably not because I've got to do World Cup stuff right now. But if, if I didn't have to do World Cup stuff at the moment, say, hey, would you mind reviewing those things? I like to do that as well. I, I really, really enjoy the work of Jane, Stephanie, Serling, uh, and, and watch their podcast and YouTube videos every single week. I enjoy the many, 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 many lists uh, provided by What Culture. Uh, and I'm... Wow, deep cut. What culture? That's uh, it's been a while. I've been I've been on the what culture wagon for a little bit. Not since uh, the culture? wrestling exodus of uh, whenever it was, 2017 or whenever it was. So I enjoy what I enjoy what culture video gaming list um, in my lunch times as well. And I I read Polygon. I read Kotaku. I desperately wish video game magazines were still around but they don't seem to be around outside Edge and whatnot. And if I'm on a long, long train journey, I'll buy a copy of Edge because I enjoy that. I'm, I'm currently going, well, at some point in time between now and the, end, and the end of October, 
I will watch the new Action Button review from Tim Robbins, where I think it's six hours long, reviewing a, a Japanese video game I've never heard of. Can't wait. Cannot wait. Um, and uh, last night, I watched a 45-minute long YouTube essay on the Shadow the Hedgehog game. Uh, I love CRPGs. I love first-person shooters. I, I want to play Fallout 1 and 2. I don't. I want to play a modernized, scrubbed up version of Fallout 1 and 2, so I don't have to save scum my way through it. <laughs> okay, that, interesting. That, that is, that is okay. me as a gamer. Um, well then, yeah. that's, I wouldn't, that's... I wouldn't openly... I know, it's the, thing, the thing my friend says, uh, they say, Carl is secretly the biggest nerd hiding in plain sight. In that you wouldn't think he's a big gamer. And then you say, hey Carl, um, how did you get past the Sith Cave in Knights of the Republic? And he'll go, aha, and push the glasses off his nose and go, here's how you do it. <laughs> See, that's fascinating because, like I say, you just you strike me as someone that doesn't have the. Because you're right, gaming is a weird thing in that it just it seems to. Because I've there are games I played multiple times and it's like, how did I ever have the time to play Fallout 4 through three times? I played Skyrim for 150 hours twice. I've played the original Pokemon Yellow God knows how many times, and there's games I've even forgotten that I've played that you when you put them in front of me, I'm like, oh crap, I've wasted a significant portion of my life on this game I don't even remember playing it but you remember how much time you played it it's not a waste if you enjoyed it it's not a waste if you enjoyed it I I, yes but I could have learnt Japanese I could have learnt piloting a plane I could have have done those extra 10 reps in the gym you know you learnt those skills right you learnt Fusuda and what did that bring you at that time what you needed so you did that I, that, that I is too, true, yes. you know, I too would absolutely love to speak Spanish better than the level I'm currently speaking Spanish. Oh, Why? Well, that's the oh, see, oh, there you go. I'm supposed to be learning Polish, and I still ain't got that. Right. I've got, I've only got hello and goodbye and various there's alcohol there's types. A certain, there's a certain amount of hours in a day, and there's a certain amount there of, is. Of, there's a certain amount of hours in a day, and there's a certain amount of things I got to do in a day, and there's a certain amount of things I want to do in a day. And I, as I'm getting older, I'm trying to not beat myself up for not doing the quote-unquote should because I'm doing things I want to do instead. Um, and having not been able to play computer games for the better part of a year because I had to do work, going back to playing computer games was just like, oh, I forgot how much I enjoyed it. <laughs> That's and, a fair if there, is, if there is a point in time where I'm, I, you know, I go back to playing a computer game and I go, this is not fun anymore. Mm. This is just habit, not a principle. Then I'll stop. Mm. Uh, and yeah, one of the principles is I like creating, I like worlds, and I like interacting with worlds. So I tend to play adventure games and RPGs uh, and things where I can play a role. Uh, I can be the chosen one, or I can be the person that damns the chosen one. Um, and there's there's a curiosity within the world. So I'm playing Horizon Zero Dawn. And I keep calling Horizon Zero Dawn too. Horizon Forbidden the West, um, and it's post-apocalyptic, and it's got a really well realized post-apocalypse. And there's loads of all these tribes and it's set in these places and there's loads of dialogue in it and I'm paying attention because someone went to loads of care and effort to make that world and it's a really well told story and it's making me think about stories I could tell in my quote unquote non-existent spare time and that's why yeah okay I probably should instead of playing Rise of the Dawn I read Zero Dawn 2 I read the Forbidden West instead of playing that for 90 minutes every single day after work I probably should be on Duolingo or probably should be going to the Spanish Institute in town and learning to speak Spanish. But at the moment, what my brain clearly wants and what my brain is responding to is recreational time, uh, which allows me to open up other portals to other things. So I'm going to do that for a bit. And I'll come back to learning Spanish when I need to come back to learning Spanish. That's, and, uh, you know, if, you, if you're still into watching this, I mean, Defunct Games, a channel that I uh, wrote and produced for, for a while, is probably up your alley in that case. Um, Cyril, the guy who hosts it, is a magnificent historian and great at context. And, uh, you know, he does quizzes and all this other stuff. But one of his things is retro gaming magazines. And it's great watching his compilations of, like, the 100 greatest games of 2001 or 1995 or whatever, because it's great to kind of take that walk down history uh, you know uh, um uh, you know uh, memory lane when it comes to a lot of the games that like you say maybe you don't enjoy playing now because 
you know you either play them to death or the mechanics are outdated or just something about the game doesn't gel anymore but at the same time it's nice to get a little bit nostalgic about a time in your life when that you know playing that game just made you happy it wasn't I didn't have to do this for any reason. I put it in my hand and I would lose hours of my life with a smile on my face and it didn't have to be more complicated than that. One of my favorite film reviewers, oddly, is Film Crit Hulk. So the, the film reviewer that writes in all caps as if he's the Incredible Hulk. Uh, I read the, <laughs> What? He, he's an amazing film critic. He, he did it. He did basically a short book, or I said, not even a short book, he did a series of essays that became a book on James Bond and it reviewed every single James Bond film chronological order up until um, Spectre. And it was one of the best things I've ever read. It was in all caps and Hulk think this. Um, <laughs> and he, he's, he's a phenomenal writer and you know, there's, there's also like a, a, a Google Chrome extension where you can copy and paste the text and put it in and it will, will take it out of all caps and like de it for you if you want. And I remember he, he he's also a gamer, does some really good gaming threads on Twitter as well. And he did a series of tweets about GoldenEye, the N64 Gold, and how much time he spent his youth playing GoldenEye. And he said he's done many things in his life that he's really, really proud of. But he knows that the best thing he's ever done, or the thing he's best at, or the thing he was best at in all of his tasks, he, he said he will never be as good at anything as he was at playing Goldeneye in his teenagers years. And look, I'm not a professional actor. I'm not a professional musician. I am a okay writer at the moment. I, I have a, I've, I've dispute got a that. You're a very good writer, but that's okay. I, well, we can just we can disagree on that. But when someone goes, "Oh, what's the thing you've done best at?" It will probably be playing a computer game, and that might be a thing because you know, I, I, I stumbled upon the thing when I was twelve when I had loads of spare time because I didn't have too much homework in year eight. Uh, I just did a thing to death. But as, if I probably go to all the things I've done to a high level, what's the thing I did to the highest level? I can think about times where I was playing Amplitude on the PlayStation Two, and I it's a rhythm game, not too distant. It's like the 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 game before. Guitar Hero. So you imagine Guitar Hero, but without the guitar controller and it's got the PlayStation guy. And I'm playing at the hardest difficulty, and you just got to hit square triangle circle on B. And it's a little bit, and in my bed, I can remember so clearly, I'm in my bedroom. I must be 16 years of age, and I'm just doing this level, and I'm not looking down at the pad, I'm just looking at the screen. And I, I, I have entered a flow state where I'm not thinking, I'm just hitting the things, I'm just hitting the things. I'm just getting this huge combo. And my brother walks in the room and he goes, oh my God, you're not even looking at the pad. I went, huh? Look down, screwed up the combo. Right, right, went back. right. And I went, and then he said, oh, I'm really sorry. He went, don't worry. And I looked at the screen again. I just went straight back to it. Racked up another 60 hit combo. And there are three or four times in my life where I can remember entering a flow state. And I can remember being in a flow state for longer than say 30 seconds. Most of those times I am playing a computer game and maybe like four of those times that I'm playing a real sport and doing well. But most of those times where I go, I am doing something to an incredible level and because I'm not even thinking about it, my reflex is just absolutely honed. It's because I'm playing a computer game. There, there was a point, not there was a point somewhere earlier this year where I was in a boss battle in Ghost of Tsushima. And you know, it's, it's that there's a really great thing. The, the people that code delete describe a feeling you get where you are fighting a group of enemies in a video game and you are down to your last bit of health but there's only one enemy left and it's that thing of oh my god i might do it uh and making sure you don't overcharge in and die but making sure you get that one sucker down last uh, and i had a moment recently playing ghost of Tsushima, and i had that and i went this is you know, my, you know, my, my eyesight might go one day, my, my knees might go, I might, you know, I might tear my Achilles, I might not be able to play five side anymore, my fingers may not be as fast to play musical instruments anymore, but I can do this, I can do that in video games for a while, and I'd like to keep doing that. Uh, I also had a thing recently, I mean, my brother's a far better video game than I am, uh, so he, he, he very much you know, initially went, oh, I'm going to play computer games because my brother's playing computer games, and then just became what's better. Uh, and now uh, mocks the thought of me when you play Marvel vs. Capcom. 
And I remember very clearly fighting the boss in Koshigashima. And I was in that state where I'm on a low bit of health, the boss is on a low bit of health, and I'm getting more and more aggressive and I'm playing on tilt. And the boss is really, I'm like making silly mistakes and not recognizing the combat patterns anymore. And I'm stopping, pausing it. My girlfriend is looking at me going, are you okay? And I'm sort of rubbing my hands <laughs> on my thighs. And I go, I'm, I, I remember going, I'm playing on tilt. My brother wouldn't want me to play on tilt. I'm better than this. I'm going to go fix this now. And she's looking at me like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm like, Christopher would want me to play this way. This is sloppy. Um, which I think is, you know, whatever you do, be it playing a computer game, doing a musical instrument, going into creative arts, man, just don't do it sloppily. Give it your full passion. Be really curious about it. Look at the thing you really enjoy and then look at the thing that inspired the thing you really enjoy. Like, go research that as well. Don't be a gatekeeping so-and-so. If someone likes the thing that you also like, be nice to them and ask them why they like that. Ask them to recommend you something as well. And something I told myself a lot more recently is this is meant to be enjoyed, not endured. Uh, it's a difficult time in the world right now. There's a lot mm. of fear in the world right now. And this winter is going to be fucking crap for loads of people. Yeah, and 100%. There's going to be many hours of many days going forward where we're just going to have to endure a lot of shit. And for that, I'm really, really sorry. But also, you should always remember that you're supposed to have some light and laughter in your life. And if your light and laughter comes from loading up Skyrim for the fifth time, because you don't necessarily want to have to endure, in air quotes, a, Pol a Polish effort, well, do that thing, man. Much too short. 100%. And, um, yeah. I, I can't top your FIFA. The only anecdote I ever had is Tekken 3, True Ogre. The other play, people were playing as Nina. I rock up. They've been dying on it for two hours. I kill him in one hit. And I sit down, and the room just quiets. And I go, what? Like, dude, we've been dying on this guy for like an hour and a half, and you perfected him on both ones. I'm like, yeah, I played this game for fucking days when I was a kid. Like, Crash Bandicoot 2 and Tekken 3 were my bread and butter on caravan holidays, weekends at my dad's, and any opportunity I had after I played Driver 2 to death. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is... Like, I'll beat True Ogre any day of the week with any character, because I got bored and played with every character. But it was so one of those moments where it was like... He is God walking among us. I'm like, nah, nah, nah. You want to see something many, real impressive. Like, done, you know what I mean? You've done some, you've, you've done many great things in your life. But it's, it's you know, the well, film crit thing, the film crit alt thing. If you think, what's the thing you've done the best of to, your, to the best of your ability? What's the thing you've, you know, you've never been better at something in the same way you've been good at Tekken 3? And I go, that's not. Oh, no, I've done things better what, than Tekken 3. Jesus Christ, I must, I hope I have. Okay, Fucking yeah. hell. There's your next podcast for yourself. What's the thing? The things I've done, the best of them. Like. It Second definitely, three. definitely Driver is two. podcasting or interviewing, but I'm working on it. Being a loving on father it. to my daughter. I am I'm the most loving father to my daughter. I've even gotten her those pool noodles to put over the lightsabers for when she hits me so that it doesn't Aww. hurt anymore. I know, right? Well, she I gave her the lightsabers when she was like two so that she could play with them and light them up. But then she developed the habit of, well, if I'm not hitting you, they're not any fun. But then I was like, do you know what? Fuck this. I got some pool noodles, cut them down to size, glued the inside, put them down, left a bit at the top so it still glows. Happy day. She can hit me as hard as she like and won't feel a thing anymore. Beautiful. Works. <laughs> and don't worry, I didn't ruin them. They, they were, I bought them so I can ruin them, okay? She's, you know, she's growing out with them anyway. And I bought her a drivable car and she never fucking used that. So that was a waste of money. Anyway, old man grumbling aside, that's our time by the looks of things, Mr. Anchor. So... Um, I have to say, there was one question I was kind of desperate to ask you, but considering our time, ask it. It's probably a more nuanced question than we have time for. Ask it, come on. Okay. And I'm going to clumsily attempt to try and relate this because I get so few opportunities to have conversations with people that I think are capable of understanding the nuance of a question and being able to give an articulate answer, as opposed to ask, kind of what you said. Question. Come on, come on. Come okay. On, come on. All right. As it relates to social media, football opportunities in life, and in terms of what what the limitations are on yourself, I, and I had a preamble joke, where do you think aspirations can carry you versus application, and how much of your application has carried you to your, your aspirations, would you say? Like, 
how much hard work have you put in versus your natural talent and how much of your natural talent has carried you through in moments where you had to recognize what you were good at to be able to carry you through certain moments but other moments you knew you had to grind and get through certain moments you are asking me how much is any one thing in what's in it's talent is an ingredient is what i would say to you um there's a adage that goes around our talent is distributed even me but opportunity is not and i am very aware that i was able to make the steps i did in the creative arts because after I graduated, I went back home to live with my parents. And my parents lived in London. If, say, my parents lived in Blackburn, then when that opportunity came about to intern for FHM, I would have had to spend a lot more money traveling down to London to stay in a hotel, going back and forth. I did, hopefully, you know, very often I give the dates of when I graduated and the dates of when I did things because one, I want everyone to understand how old I am. And two, the internet was a very different place in those times, in those times, right? Going on YouTube in 2013 is a completely different experience from going on YouTube in 2022. Uh, and going into an internship in 2013 should hopefully, for the love of God, be very different to doing an internship in 2022. I did a lot of unpaid internships when I graduated because I could afford to, because I lived at home. I didn't have to think about paying rent. Um, I know there are a lot of people who, when they graduated in 2012 and 2013, probably had more talent than I did, probably have greater application than I did, probably had uh, not only the same curiosity level as me, but also proofread their own articles better than me, had a greater understanding of grammar and market, greater, uh, had a wider and deeper knowledge of the things I was interested in, but also didn't live in London and also couldn't afford that internship. So that made things difficult for them. I also know that my ability to my interest in certain things meant i have perhaps certain advantages over certain people in the office right i am a tall sporty gentleman who knows a lot about quote unquote the male topics uh, and when I had a gap in my information, I'd often go home and research that topic because like, the boss keeps dropping Alan Partridge references. I don't know what Alan Partridge is. I'm going to go home and watch Alan Partridge. Uh, there was a point in time where I often go home and I'd stop by H and V, the three DVDs for a tenner, and I'd buy the DVDs people in the room were talking about, so I could come back and continue those conversations. So that is a combination of soft skill. That's my like my natural curiosity coming together with just something that really shouldn't really have a bearing on whether I get a job or not, which is how do you interact in an office space? Um, and now in 2022, when most of us are working from home, do you need that? Do you need the ability to go home and to, to switch on and watch an episode of Sexy Beast or to watch something else to talk to, to a boss? And that might get you a better recommendation as that way. I'd say, again, things aren't binary. They place you on a spectrum. Um, the way I often describe it is you are born somewhere on a spectrum uh, and then you are often given the ability to travel up and down a certain section of that spectrum and then hopefully uh, if you want to move up that slightly further opportunities can be given to you by people higher up so one thing you know, I'm talking to you as a black person working full-time in the media space there's not that many the 0.2 journalists in the United Kingdom are black uh, which is quite concerning considering yeah, well, I might, really, have, had a, I might have had a, a question relating to that too, but again, in the ham-fisted way, I was worried about broaching it because of the anecdote that I had for it. So you'll forgive me for not stumbling yeah. into that and making it's a fool of myself in that situation. In kingdom of black. Now, proportionally based on your population, that might be that might be representation. That might be proportional representation in terms of population. But if you look at where are the publishing places placed in the United Kingdom, London, which is thirty percent not white, then you would expect more. Black journalists, where they're based. And if you look in the places where journalists are placed um, and what beats they have and whether they work full time or not, uh, and while, where are they working in front of the camera or behind the camera or are there pathways into that, uh, those things are of interest to me. So, one thing I'm really, you know, I'm constantly doing, I'm 31 now, is going, if you're a black student, 
Uh, if you are, you know, the 21 year old who's just graduated and goes, I need, I want to be a journalist. I need to go contact someone and possibly get that internship. I will now try and be that person for you. I will now try and be the person who can mentor you or go, you sent me the wrong CV. You actually want to be a nature documentarian. Uh, and that is how it works. It's the thing of, have you ever read Moneyball or Freakonomics? Uh, I haven't read them, but I'm, I'm familiar with Moneyball, yeah. So one of, the, one of the big topics in, in Freakonomics is what's the easiest way to become a baseball player? And they say it's to be the son of a baseball player. Right, okay. Because they say, one, you might have the natural aptitude that you might have inherited from your parent. But more importantly, if you are the child of a baseball player, scouts are going to be looking at you from day one. Because like, hey, I know your dad. Are you anywhere, right. anywhere near as good as your dad? Two, if your pirate, if your parent was a ba- baseball player, they tend to have tend to earn quite a bit of money. So if at any point in time in your early childhood you show an aptitude at baseball, they can go, here you go. I'm going to push you towards baseball and get you the best coaches and put you on the best team instead of you being not able to access baseball tools and whatnot. Uh, and that is how I think of a lot of these things in that. I understand I was given a certain amount of tools and given a certain amount of attributes at an early age. And then I had to practice at home and work on those things. I had to maximize certain things. I had to tone down certain things. But also I had to make sure I was in the right position at the right time. I, I've got more jobs from ridiculous... Me- I met a person in a room and was introduced to them than I have from CVs. Uh, and that makes me happy and sad because I remember all the times where I would spend 30 or 40 CVs, send 30 or 40 CVs in a week and not get anything. And my mum went, you seem really sad. Here's 10 quid, go get yourself a, you know, a pizza to cheat yourself up on. Uh, and now when I meet the next generation that are doing that and sending loads of CVs and they're really sad, I go, here's 10 quid, go get yourself a pizza. It's really hard. It takes hard work. It takes a lot. It takes hard work. It takes a bit of luck. It takes momentum and direction. And sometimes momentum is more important than direction. You can go out there and graduate and think you're going to one day work at Game Master Magazine uh, and think that you actually don't ever want to write about football because you don't believe that level of discourse of football conversation is very interesting. And at some point, someone will find you the right opportunity to write about football in the way you want to write about. It. You never know. Yeah, I mean, the, the sad, again, the, the anecdote, just for clarity, is um, I was working in a van center. It was the guy that you chuck your keys to at one point. I got into this really great conversation with this, um, I think he must have been 45, 50 gentleman. And we got into the conversation of representation. And I, I remember kind of thinking, like, what's the, what do you mean? He's like, well, yeah, I just really lament the fact that, you know, I'm never going to see another black manager in my lifetime. And I went, what do you mean? Like, because I, mean, I think it was it was Chris Hewton, I think, that had just been yeah. sacked at the time. And I remember saying, like, right, but there's, 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 you know, the era's coming up and there's da, da, da. and he goes, no, nah, you don't get it. They're, they're not going to look at him for the job. I was like, but he's he's in New York getting the thing and he'd be perfect. Like, nah, you just, you're a bit young. Oh, and I was young in fairness, but it's because I didn't see it and he'd been raised in it. And it was this thing of, right, and, and the thing you have to do is you have to uh, alert. It's, what's the, um, there's like a spell or a popular cultural reference where it's like, you know, they exist and you can't see them until you actually start looking at it. And I remember kind of thinking like, oh man, I'd hate for there to be more of those things. Like with women's football and the advent of the uh, the, the popularity surge with that and you kind of, you know, waking up to the prospects of it's just football. Who's playing it is almost immaterial. And, and the fact that we have to put a distinction between the two is kind of a sad thing these days. But it it still exists. And there's a there's a spectrum of people that have to look at it in certain terms. And I guess, again, rightly or wrongly, I lament that. And I wish people would would look at things on a more logical and analytical merit from that perspective because i think you know because like you said is that really a true statistic then that, that as, as far as writers are concerned I mean, I'm, I'm talking to you right now i'm 31 and i know there is certain things i want in my life professionally speaking that i might not get because i might not get because of my skin color is that so? This is why I, I don't want to ask this question from a, a, a bold head because I knew I'd stumble into the question rather than ask it succinctly. But is that something you feel or is that categoric in your mind? Because I, I'd i hate for that to be the thing, but I worry that me, like a lot of people, just because I hate, I would hate it to be the thing, 
makes me blind to the fact that it is a thing. You know it, what I mean? It, it's it's a feeling. I, I it's something that sometimes feels categorical to me, but I have to remind myself it's a feeling. And the at some point, hope is a discipline, right? It's something you have to practice and work and and and, and repeat over and over and over and over and over again. And when I wake up in the morning and I switch on the news, I would like there to be a certain thing in the news. And sometimes that thing isn't there. And I go to bed and I hope that a certain thing is on the news when I wake up. Right. And so on and so on. And you, you do certain things sometimes entirely out of hope. Um, one big underlying, if you want to get really good at writing the football, you have to understand at some point in time, you're writing and trading in the idea of hope transfer rumors and transfer dealings are you selling and writing hope to people right uh and there are some days where i will go to bed and go this is just too much this world is going to simply it simply overwhelms me and everything is doomed and everything's blah 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 blah, blah, blah. and then you <clears throat> practice hope which is sometimes playing computer games which is sometimes watching media you like sometimes talking to your friends sometimes looking to the eyes of people that have been there and done it before you and gone actually if you did that i can do that uh, i watched stormzy's music video and i got goosebumps at the spoken word segment written by rich 32 and, and dictated and it, you know perfectly de delivered by michaela cole talking about how this isn't just a phase this is phase one of, of the black british culture and going there is no ceiling people try to put one on me I've been, there have been times in my life where I've been made to think there was a ceiling, but there isn't one. I can absolutely punch through this thing. Absolutely punch through this thing. And if I can't, I can leave an absolutely devastating dent in it for the next person. And it's that second bit. If I can't do it, I'm going to dent that thing so hard the next person can get through. That now drives me through a lot more of my creative endeavors. I'm talking to you right now. I'm 31 years of age. I'm one of the very few um, black British football journalists that are hired full time for a media company. There's very often when I go to press conferences, sit in the press box, I'm the only black person there. Uh, there was a time where I covered England for the Euros, and one of the stewards came up to me and shook my hand and went, We don't see many of us in the press box. I want to say, I'm so proud of you, young man. Keep doing what you're doing. You're going to do great things for the next generation. And I, you know, that sounds like such a heavy thing to because again, you're thirty, you're my age. If someone came up to me and said you're a hope for future people, I don't know what I would do with that from the perspective of number one, I shouldn't be, but the fact that I am, I don't know if I'm equipped or if I'm am I the right person for that just because like, but because you are like, that must be such a a horrible but a, hor a terrible wonderful burden in a sense like you're a dad you already do this every day d what do i do every day you're an inspiration for someone oh hell no oh come on i'm i'm the you're i'm the dad. least the only piece of inspiration i've given my daughter is we were watching the women's euros she turned to me and said daddy can girls girls can play football can they and i said of course they can you can do literally anything you want she turned around play continued to play with her barbie dolls but she was that watching the game while she was doing it that's the that's only piece so of inspiration i'm gonna give that's her so important but that's <laughs> basic this is what i say this is why this this concept is so mind-bogglingly annoying to me when you see the 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 england euro finals and the the way the country was and in a moment this weird hatred is skewn out of nowhere and it's infuriating to me because it's based on nothing but ignorance in an age where you have access to all the information and knowledge and history that you could possibly want and you make the same fucking mistakes. It's 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 infuriating and it must be even worse because I'm not even sub su subject to it. I'm the person that gets to skate by going it's terrible and everyone's going, well, why do you care? Well, because I don't uh, like it. I wouldn't want anyone treated any differently, it's, unless they're a bad person. Treat that person badly, sure. Uh, I'm sorry for say, yelling, but it's my... I will you know, say uh, I, I commend your passion. I commend your enthusiasm for understanding certain things should be basic. I commend the fact that you told your daughter, yeah, you can be absolutely anything. Because you have to think, you know, in the last 50 or 60 years, 
they would have been dead stuff not said that. Well, I suppose for safety, because again, this is the thing. I there mean, would have been there would, there would have been people who didn't say the thing you said, and that would have had possible reverberations on someone's life in a way. So the fact that you said it without even thinking about it, well done. And yeah, look, if I think about certain things for too long, oh yeah, I might I might feel certain pressures and I might behave in a certain way. But something I think about a lot is I can only be me. Um, I can only be Carl Anker in this life. Uh, and uh, I am most effective and most successful when I'm Karl Anker. And I tend to be quite miserable when I'm trying to be someone else. And if there is a version of me out there where me doing Karl Anker things is useful to the world and is useful for people looking for certain things, then so be it. And if there is a point where me doing Karl Anker things is to the detriment of people and to the detriment of people out the world, I'm going to try my best to stop doing that. And that's all I can do. That's all I want to do. It just it uh, again. I wasn't I was again the ham-fisted way of approaching the subject because again, I mean, for clarity, you know, my my experiences only range from being called a Gillian's chocolate once by one of my friends who explained to me calmly and collectively, who was a black guy by the way. Before I preface this story, um, you're black on the outside. Uh, sorry, white on the inside, black on the inside. And I was like. What the hell are you talking about? It's because I shared some of his interests that none of his other friends did, and he had to act a certain way around certain uh, demographics of friends. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've heard, dude. You just do you, and you'll be fine. But it was something I wasn't cognizant of that age, because, as you're alluding to, I've noticed that in my workspaces, it's... Do you know what? Actually, he was the only black guy on our floor, and there wasn't any other multicultural diversity in there. Now I go into my office, and it is... It's, it's what you would have anticipated all along had you just said you're the most qualified person we want you rather than as you've alluded to oh you're so and so's mate aren't you or you're the daughter of this person yeah okay cool yeah we've got a job for you and then when the person who was qualified came along it's sorry we don't have space what you don't have space for the best people is that a good way to run a business to preclude people you want to preclude people based on nothing it's I don't know. It's frustrating, but we—I've stolen twenty-three minutes extra of your time. How rude! Stolen like a thief in the night. I know. I'm sorry. You have gaming to get on with. You've and into I've... my gaming and my working time. I'm How sorry, dare man. You? I'm sorry. Well, listen. I'll, I'll wrap it by asking the standard, as the kids say. You know, the standard. Is that what they do? Um, where can people find you? Uh, obviously, the athletic. Uh, where can? What are your socials? What are your platforms? Where will you be? Do you have anything you want people desperately to be aware of? What do you, what do you um, say? Um, yeah, so you can find my writing over on The Athletic. I cover Manchester United several times a week. I also have a general column on The Athletic doing writing. If you're a Manchester United fan, you can find me on the Talk of Devils podcast, on The Athletic podcast feed. If you, I also pop up on Wrighty's House podcast, which is the podcast hosted and run by Ian Wright. My uh, lord and, and saviour. Made by the very, very clever people, Musa Wong and Ryan Hunt from the Stadio Universe as well uh, every now and again i pop up in the talking tactics podcast as well uh, which i chip in with daniel to look and any enigmatic gentleman could have hope you can find me on twitter anchorman616 anchor is spelled a-n-k-a that's my surname the 616 yes that's a marvel reference <laughs> uh you can find me on instagram if you want to find me uh, and also i wrote two books in color well I helped reorganize a little bit of sentence and grammar on Marcus Rashford's books. Uh, you are a champion and you can do it. So those are two uh, children's nonfiction books that are supposed to be um, motivational self-help guides to children between the ages of, well, initially I wrote, <laughs> initially, they were envisioned for uh, 11 to 16 year olds, but I've seen them being read by people as young as six and as old as 66 so uh, that's been quite edifying as well so. i forgot completely that i was supposed to ask you about that because that seemed like a fascinating subject and i didn't even get to tease you about the fact that you got to cover united for a living damn it what a what a missed opportunity as an arsenal fan but never mind um thank you so hold that oh wow really we're going there just uh, jo okay fine that's a good way of wrapping up instead of false platitudes and niceties there we go he's clicking the stop he, I'm, I'm pressing it i'm pressing the stop button now it's been pressed no it hasn't now it has